All right, so for day one of part three, the first thing we can look at is let's go to pouchdb.com. PouchDB, the database that syncs. PouchDB is an open source JavaScript database inspired by Apache CouchDB that is designed to run well within the browser. PouchDB was created to help web developers build apps that work as well offline <coughs> as they do online. It enables apps to store data locally while offline, then synchronize with CouchDB and compatible servers when the app is back online, keeping the user's data in sync no matter where they next log in. So this is a big challenge with making an app. When you're in a modern app, it's, it's often data-driven. There's information that needs to be stored and retrieved and edited. That's a database. But the problem is you need usually a server. You need an infrastructure. You need you know, some sort of cloud infrastructure to save your data. There's been more of a push for these types of databases that work without all of that infrastructure, without all of that you know, setup. PouchDB does that. It's going to create a database in the web browser. It's going to use a variation of local storage, but a better and more powerful version. It then is better than local storage because it can then replicate itself. It can save this data to a server. Once it's on a server and I, and I update my uh, my Moto G2 into a Moto G3, I can then retrieve the data to the new device and the data comes with me. So this is what we're going to work with. And it's going to be the familiar sorts of idioms of JavaScript. We're still going to create variables. We're going to use methods. We're going to use methods, commands that are specific to PouchDB. Dot put method is not a plain built-in JavaScript command. It's one that makes sense when you have PouchDB. But we have a database that will create a new instance of the PouchDB object, and then we're putting data into the database in JSON format, which is very easy to kind of wrap your mind around. JSON format is basically key and value pairs in a specific syntax some sort of field in the database with some sort of data in that field. Name, colon, David, age, colon, 69, underscore ID, and email. <coughs> so fields in a record. <coughs> All of this is a bundle of data with the curly braces. That's JSON. Uh, JSON is just data bundled together in this format. Curly braces, key and value pairs separated by commas. It's also known as a flat database. Um, because the data in a SQL database, in a MySQL database, in a, in a Oracle database, in a FoxPro database, etc., it's still basically key value pairs, which may, may be more complex with uh, relations, relational databases, but um, any amount of data with value pairs in a bundle, and then we put the data into the database. We will then have other commands, other methods. If there are changes to the database, do something, anything. Here is just some console output. A data uh, a change that we could do is copy this database to the server. When something changes locally on the device, copy that to the server. And that's as simple, in theory, as db.replicate.2, your server. So if you've got a server set up with the right infrastructure there, you'll be able to save this data to that server. And then you will have replicate from the server get the data off of the server back onto the device. So it's cross-browser, lightweight, easy to learn, it's open source, they're updating it all the time. The latest version is 6.11, released on in January of this year. Let's go to the top under, under learn. Yeah, let's look at learn at the top. 
There's about information, frequently asked questions. <coughs> PouchDB is an in-browser database that allows apps to save data locally, etc. You can read this all on your own. There's a community that works on this. Browser support. Basically, all the web browsers and all of the devices are able to handle this. PouchDB also runs in a Cordova project. That's exactly what we have. It is framework agnostic, and you can use it with Angular, React, etc., all the other hot uh, frameworks for modern apps. Node.js, uh, etc. Let's look at the FAC. A downside is, can we use Pouch to synchronize with other kinds of databases, like the more popular MySQL? Short answer is no. Your back end needs to speak with the CouchDB replication protocol. So uh, if you've got a database on a server in CouchDB format, then yes, then our app can connect to it, save the data there. If I've got a server with a MySQL database, then it, no, it cannot connect. So that might sound like a big drawback. But again, this is a database running in the modern style known as the NoSQL paradigm. It's based in JavaScript. Instead of having to learn a whole new language and syntax just to use MySQL, we continue to use the familiar of JavaScript. MySQL, we often need to use PHP to interface with it. Oftentimes, we make a website, we write PHP to simply talk to the database, pull data out of the database. PHP then further processes the data out of MySQL and puts it back into your website. So you have to learn PHP just to connect to that database. CouchDB and other related databases is still JavaScript. So I learned, I've learned, been learning JavaScript. I use what I, what I know there, and I can make and create and use databases. And there's plenty of documentation then on how to get it to work with a server and all of that. We're going to start easy by first creating it in the browser, and then we'll migrate it to our app. So it goes on to say that uh, it works with basically you know Android and iOS. How much data can it store for all intents and purposes? Uh, a lot. Because database data in a database. Let's say Instagram. Uh, Instagram, of course, is running on some database. And what's stored in the database of Instagram is not every single picture, but references to pictures on the rest of the server. There's a server that's storing all the pictures, and then there's a database on the server that has links to the pictures. So technically, usually, you don't store the actual picture in the database. It's too much data. A picture is, you know, hundreds of kilobytes, thousands of kilobytes. You don't really store that in a database. You store plain text, you store references to data elsewhere. So Android basically holds 200 megabytes of data. You think, well, 200 megabytes, my flash drive is 32 gigabytes. Again, doesn't matter. We're not storing the actual picture data in the database. We're storing references to the data elsewhere. So these limitations on data are not really limitations. And we can create more than one instance. We can create seven databases, and each one is 200. So I've got, you know, one and a half, mega, uh, one and a half uh, gigabytes of data to store. So that's not a limitation. What types of data? We have documents and attachments. Basically, it's raw data as in JSON format, plain old text. Uh, we can stringify or serialize data back and forth. If you don't know what that means, we'll get to it. We can, we can have attachments. We can have the whole blob of data, the whole raw data of a picture, but it's very inefficient to do that. All the browsers can handle it. Uh, other information. You can browse the various documentation all over here. There's going to be a, a, a task here, a tutorial on how to make a to-do list, a very popular way to teach databases. We'll look at that at some point. Uh, there's an error 
intersection, examples of who's using this data, base. And then the API is uh, all the hardcore documentation. Guides is a little more user-friendly, but the API here is all of the, the, the nerdiest way to learn it all. So taking a quick look at the API, it's in the format of you know, your database object with some method which may have which usually has arguments and can have optional options <coughs> and callbacks, callback functions. So it uses the, mo the modern promises as well, if you know how to use those. How to create the database, it's all, it's all here. But we're going to dive right into it. This is what we're going to use, OuchDB. Any sort of general questions at this point about? Yes? So if Couch is limited in the size of the database, Pouch. using your analogy of the or Mr. Couch, all you're doing is saving a reference to another external source, mm -hmm. then can it not access more data than just what's limited with, with Couch? Pouch is the one that's limited. Couch okay. is, is not. Uh, but you've got, okay, 200 megabytes to store. Uh, and those are going to be references to uh, parts of the file structure. Those are infinitesimal smaller than the actual data. You know, to store a path to some place, you know, right here, this is a path. The, the actual bytes and letters here, that's like 20 bytes mm -hmm. to store a link to a website that's 100 megabytes. So I'm not sure if that's quite answering your question. I don't see it as a limitation because the data to the, you know, the references to the data, it's 200 megabytes, which is relatively good amount to store. And the data itself on the server, well, that's limited to how much you're paying to store data on your server. If I upgrade you know, from a one terabyte size server to a two terabyte, I can access two terabytes of pictures. My database is just referencing, linking to that data. Any other sort of questions? So the example that I just showed a moment ago is using this stuff. We're going to create a database, fetch the data, delete it, all this stuff. You can read that on your own, pouchdb.com. What we do need to do, however, is we either need uh, a reference to uh, the JavaScript library online, or we need the file. We might as well get the file because eventually we're going to add it to our project. I don't want to rely again on online resources. If a person doesn't have internet connection, then the database will not work. We should download the database file to be able for this to work. So go to pouchdb.com and click download version 612. I should simply want to download a JavaScript file uh, right here. We want the pouch 612 minified JS. And it's just going to be a reference. We could copy and paste this into our file and it's going to connect to the online version. But again, if we don't have an online, if we don't have an internet connection, the database will just not work. And then people will blame you. Why is your app not working? Well, it's not my fault, it's the JS developer website's not working. I want to avoid that. So we're going to download the actual library. You should just be able to click it and it should start to download. If you see a bunch of the code instead, I guess you want to right click and save. And I want to set up on my flash drive. On my flash drive, I want to set up. <coughs> On my flash drive, I want to set up a folder called uh, Pouch Practice and put that jo JavaScript file into that folder. So 
So on my flash drive, I've got a folder for this class. And in that folder, I've made a folder right now called Pouch Practice. And I've downloaded the pouch file into that folder. I also want the jQuery library. So I'm going to go over to my flash drive, my apps folder, my project folder. I'm getting the, I'm getting the JavaScript jQuery file. You have a copy of it somewhere. Find it on your flash drive or the network folder. I want the jQuery library. Copy that also into your pouch practice. You don't need it, but I want to use it because using jQuery is often a lot better than using plain old JavaScript. So from your flash drive or network folder, grab a copy of the jQuery 2 JavaScript file. Not the jQuery mobile. We don't need that yet. Just the jQuery library. So we're going to, from scratch, create, again, uh, a simple HTML project to focus on using Pouch. We don't need the whole overhead of setting up Cordova, plugging in a mobile device, and all that. I just want to write the code, and we can, at this point, simply write some HTML and JavaScript, and then we will integrate it into our Cordova project. So we should have the Pouch library and the jQuery library. I'm going to open Notepad and we'll create a new HTML file. And then uh, I'm saving an HTML file. I can just call it Pouch Prac with today's date. It'll take a couple of days to set this up, and then eventually we'll integrate it into our main project. So you want, the, you want the, those two JavaScript libraries, and you want an HTML file in your project. HTML file can be named anything, of course, but I'm putting today's date on it because we'll work on it for a few days. I'm going to do the usual in creating a super simple HTML5 project. Um, the usual 10 lines HTML, head, body, uh, car set, meta car set. Title, we can just say pouch practice, pouch db practice, and a heading one, pouch db practice. So the most basic 10 lines, <coughs> and we'll add the JavaScript libraries. Then we'll start writing the actual code. Did everyone get the, uh, the new ad code? If you came a little late, remember you need a new ad code. It's a new class. You need to register. It would be a shame that you forget to register and you don't actually get, uh, sign up for part three. You did part one and part two, and you don't get the certificate. So make sure you enrolled with the ad code. Also make sure you signed in the usual, the think sheet. The hours are also important. We're close to the end for our certificate. So make sure you are enrolled and you sign in.
So we need to then link to the these two libraries. The only one we need is the pouchdb file. But I also want to use jQuery because it helps us write our code easier, less mistakes, and it opens up a few more special features that are uh, a little bit of, a little bit beyond plain old JavaScript. So before the end of body, we're going to add a script tag. The source of that is our jQuery file. jQuery 2.1.0.min.js. Usually we want to have the jQuery library loaded first. If we switch the two around, we may be trying to use code from one library that's built on another library, and usually jQuery is the foundational library for most projects. So we load that first. Then after that, we'll connect over to the uh, pouch library. And then after that, we'll, we'll write some embedded JavaScript. So we'll have a block over here where we'll write JavaScript. So our custom JavaScript eventually we'll move it to that index.js file once we integrate this with our main project. And we're going to write some HTML here, and eventually we'll cut and paste that, we will integrate that with our Cordova project. And then eventually when we get to the Cordova project, we will add this pouch reference. And everything that we do here, we can pretty, mi pretty easily, relatively migrate it over to a Cordova project. But I want to focus here, you know, it's not going to look pretty, we don't have jQuery mobile, but it's going to be functional, and that's what I want to do first. Make this sure this works before I wrestle with animations and the pop-ups and all of that stuff. I want it to make I want to make sure it works first. The way this will work is eventually in our Cordova project there will be a screen that pops up where the student can save a class list. This is the idea. The MySDCE app eventually will have a way for students to save stuff. I want them to save a list of classes that they've taken or an educational plan that they have. So our classes at the college are defined with a CRM number, a, a, an instructor, and, and a name of a class. We can save other information like notes about the class if we want. We'll start off with those three pieces of data first. So we're going to need to collect data from the user. In the body then I'll create a form, a form to accept user input. So I'll back up and we'll create a form. We'll give it an ID so that we can reference it in the JavaScript. Remember the amazing thing about JavaScript is that it can reference and <coughs> change and create anything of HTML or CSS, if we can target it. So with an ID, we will be able to write JavaScript to target that form. And we'll call the form um, form class. This is a form that will collect class information. We have uh, any name that we want here. I'm calling the form form class. We're going to have a few input fields. First we'll have a label. This is the visible text that will appear next to the input box. Uh, this label will, dis will ask for a CRN. What does that stand for? Class reference number, I think. Every class has a CRN. Our, ref, our CRN for this class right now is 9619E. So we're going to ask for a CRN number. We're going to plug. They're going to plug it into an input field of type text. So 
you know, the, the user will see CRM and an input box. We need to link this label with this input box. Right now, visually, we might see it, but we also want it to, to be actually linked properly, semantically, in the code. We need to name this input box to then link this label to it. So let's call the label, let's call the input box first its name. The name of this input box, we will call it um, in CRN. It's an input box that accepts a CRN. <coughs> so this label is going to be used for that input box. It has an attribute of for, F-O-R, with the exact same name. This label is for this input box because it's named the same. And for me, what makes sense, it may make different sense for you, that's fine. In CRN makes sense, it's an input box accepting CRNs. It's very common for us to use IDs. In the, Java, in the HTML, so that in the JavaScript we can reference what the person typed. So I will further add an ID attribute to the input and make it the same as the name. Looks redundant, it sort of is, uh, but this is common here. So now this has a unique identifier for the JavaScript to reference what did they type. I'm going to back up because I like to leave ID or name or class as the last attribute. And I'll add one more attribute, a placeholder. Placeholder is text that will appear to tell people, this is what you should type here. They may not know what to type. So if I give an example, you know, whatever, like a class, uh, CRN, whatever, doesn't matter, 9618B. That's the format of the CRNs for our college. Four digits and a letter. That's why here I'm saying input of type text. If we had input of type number, it would only really accept numbers. Our CRNs have a letter. So we have to say text, which will accept a letter or a number, sort of. And this is guiding people. You should type a number like this here. We're going to make another input field pretty much exactly the same as this. So to save myself some effort, first at the end, we'll add a break. And then I'm going to copy that whole line and paste it two more times. I want two more input fields. I want a name. I want an ID. I want a placeholder. I don't want to retype all of that. I just want to change some of the details. So after you write a break, copy that whole line and then paste it two more times. We're going to ask for a CRN, class name, instructor name. So the label here asks for class, and then the third one, instructor. First box asks for a CRN, then class and instructor. They're all going to be text, they're all going to be inputs, placeholders. Okay, so for placeholder of a class, we'll make it what we'll make it up for Android one. Placeholder for the instructor, we'll put campus. You know, just some placeholders to tell people what they should type there. Also for just for alignment, totally optional. I'm going to tab these over so that they kind of line up like that. These words are longer, so then they kind of have tabbed in here just so they line up optional but kind of a little easier to read also placeholder for class android one placeholder for instructor campus so i'm telling here people what they can type or what they should type name and id and four that needs to change in CRN, or the CRN, in class, 
for class and in instructor for instructor. So it should make sense why I'm doing that. I'm using in as sort of my prefix, prefix that this is an input field. And in this input field, it's going to be class, its name, and the ID, and the four. While I'm, while I'm on this part of the code, in instructor, in instructor. No, I don't have time to type instructor, so I'll just type in inst. Whatever we name these things, of course, we need to memorize them or refer to them. And then change your fours on the label as necessary. In inst, in class, and that changes my tags. And again, it depends how obsessive you want to get about this, but if you fully want all of these things lined up, you can tab those over. Nice and readable. At a glance, I can see the, the areas where I can make changes. It's optional, but it looks nice. So those are all input fields. We have this is plain old HTML. We have input fields. We've had them since you know 1990 when HTML uh, was invented, basically. But we have different types. We can look these up. We have text type. We have number type. We have date type. We have types of data that we can accept. We're keeping it very basic with text. Eventually, we want results. Uh, we gather data. We process it. We display it. So I want a placeholder. After the form, I want a placeholder to then display the processed data. A div will work there. I did a div rather than a span. I want it as a block level element. I want it to take its, up, its own space and push the other things away and focus on itself. And this needs an ID for a way for us to reference it. I'll call this div results. This is the div that will show results. I call it here because when I'm on line 200 of my JavaScript, hopefully I remember I want to display results on my screen. Oh, I have a div for that. So HTML equals div results, sort of. We can save it and run it. We're going to get used to, of course, opening up the console as soon as possible. Doesn't matter which browser. Uh, I kind of like the, how it looks a little better on. Uh, on uh, Chrome, uh, especially when we look at the data in the database. So I'd recommend you run this in Chrome. Firefox should work fine. Go ahead and run this in Chrome. Open your, your console right away, F12. Hopefully you get no errors. It doesn't work yet, of course, but we shouldn't have any surprises. Console seems fine. Got some input fields, placeholders. <clears throat> So as soon as I start typing, the placeholder goes away. In the old days, you'd have to write some custom JavaScript for that to work, and now we have the, the, the HTML5 attribute placeholder equals, and it does it. I remember that in the old days, having to write JavaScript to detect when did the person put their mouse in the box and delete the data and then read on mouse out and all of that. And now placeholder does it. Our code so far. We have uh, input fields. We need buttons now. We need at least one button to start to do anything. We need a button for it to to, to start to do the process. We need a, a trigger for our JavaScript to, to run. 
So back to the form, after the last label, we need a button, which is another input element, but this time of type button. Attribute a value so that we can have the button say something like save or go or proceed or whatever. I'll say go. And an ID so that we can affect it with JavaScript. We'll call this btn go. So I'm using here the prefix of btn. I guess I could do in go. But here it's a button that will go or save or whatever. Checking my results. I simply have a go button. It doesn't go yet. When you're filling in a form, what uh, what two buttons are most common? Go or save, and what else? Reset or start over or cancel. Let's make another button so that this resets the form to start over. So I've got the input button, space. I'll do another input type. We have a type of reset. It's built in to reset a form. We might as well use it. We do have a type of submit, but it has a sort of baggage that's built in that uh, often gets in the way. So I'm doing a generic button for save, but we do have input type of submit. We have an input type of reset, which has built-in features of resetting the form. That could have been a simple button, but then I'd have to program in JavaScript what does reset do. And our value for that is whatever you want, clear or cancel. Let's do cancel. We'll also give that an ID. We, we actually perhaps wanted to do more later than simply clearing out the form. <coughs> ID btn cancel. So uh, a button to grab the results, a button to start over. We need a button to show the results. We will make it automatic later, but for the moment we'll have a button to show the results, to put the data back into this div. So we'll make another button here, input type button. Value. Uh, show classes ID BTN show If we test that, we can type data into it and you can cancel it. It should work. If you type data and click go, nothing happens yet. And if you click show, nothing happens yet. Okay, let's pause here and make sure everyone has something like this. Check your console, no errors. Type in whatever for these at the moment. Go does nothing, that's expected. Cancel should cancel. And show doesn't do anything yet either. That's where we're at. Anyone need a little help? So we've got a form. We've got a div to show results. And we're going to write a lot of JavaScript in a moment.
Okay, so our custom code is going to be in our script here. We could have it in a separate file, but I just want to keep it in one file to streamline our editing. We'll go into our script block. Comment here. Create a pouch db database. Var. We're using variable again. This is a powerful concept in JavaScript. This creates an object. And this object can be just about anything. Here we're creating a whole database in this variable. We'll call it simply db database equals. We're then assigning something to that variable. And the magic is here. New space pouch capital P db capital D, capital B, parentheses, semicolon. We're creating a new instance of the pouch object. Without this reference to this library, this makes no sense. You get errors. It'll say, what's a pouch DB? So this, of course, needs to be typed in properly. So a new database. But we can create multiple databases, therefore we need a name. In the parentheses, in quotes, we can make up any name. We'll call this my SDCE. There's going to be a database internally. The user never sees this. Somewhere in the bowels of the app will be the database called my SDCE. And eventually, when we get it into the app, for the moment, it'll be in the web browser somewhere. Is the database called my SDCE, a new instance of it. And we put it into our variable to be able to use it. To see if this worked, console log db. Let's see some feedback. Let's run it in Chrome or Firefox. And at the very least, we should get some basic feedback that we created the database. If you get an error, most likely it was because of uh, something was misspelled. Let me check mine. I'm going to run it. My console says some stuff. It may simply say OE. You may have to open it. Or it may actually show something like this. If it doesn't show anything, try opening the little triangle there. But it's, uh, it's saying something. It's saying a bunch of stuff, and it's saying name, my SDCE, that's what I chose there, a bunch of other things, adapter and type, and lots of stuff. Did everyone get some kind of feedback in the console? If this one, if this doesn't work, nothing else will work. Question? No. Now, another place where we can see this database is here in Chrome. You can uh, you can look under application. If you don't see application, it might be hidden under this double arrow. Go to application. We were in this screen when we were when we were looking at local storage. When we were looking at the basic local storage data, it was here. PouchDB. Uh, is a variation of indexed db. So inside of this view, we have the database. We have also Web SQL. There's like, as always, there's two competing standards for web databases: indexed db and Web SQL or Web SQL. Uh, I don't know which one's winning at the moment, but I'm going to say indexed db because we're using PouchDB. But inside of that, if you open that, this is pouch my SDCE. If you click on that, it's got some data there. And inside of this web browser, it's got this data. And inside of that, you see different ways to see your data. For example, by sequence, there's nothing in the data base. We're able to see the data in various ways. You should see index DB pouch. In Firefox, it's some other screen that I don't remember where it's at, but we can find it. That's why I'm saying let's look at this in Chrome. And we will see key and value and the number in the database. We will see 
you know, name equals Victor. We will see class equals Android. We will see whatever amount of data in simple key value pairs. We will bundle the data together. One class is made out of CRN X, instructor Y, and class name Z. Those three pieces of data will all be in the same value of one of these keys. The key, then, is very important. It's the differentiator between all the data. When you go to a website and you create an account, I want to create an account and call myself Victor. Whoops, someone already took that name. So Victor was the unique identifier that separated one Victor account from every other Victor account. We will have something like that in PouchDB as well. How do we separate this data from that data? It's going to be its main key. We'll be able to see the data here under application. We'll give ourselves some console output. And this is what we should have at the moment. If this says undefined there, that's normal. But you should not have errors. So before we go on, no one has errors, right? Okay, so what we did here was we created an object to store our database so we can use the database. A better way to do this is to set up an initialization, initialization routine because this creates the database and we're ready to go. But later, we will need to delete the database to start over. Maybe the user wants to start all over and delete all their classes and start all over. If we set up a, a function or some sort of algorithm to be able to easily reinitialize a database, that, that will be better. That's a little forward thinking. I know we're going to do that later. And if we didn't, we would eventually figure that out and have to backtrack. So I'm going to say, let's do this a little bit better in that we, we, we separate the creation of the object from the creation of the database. So let's go back to where we created the, the database object here and end the line right after var db and then separate that to another line. I want to create an object called db that has not been assigned anything yet. So end the line there. <coughs> Create a variable db, end of line. Then on the next line, db equals new pouch. I want to wrap this. I want to wrap the actual database instantiation in a function. So I can call the function whenever I need it. I may need to do several things besides create the database. I may need to check, is there already a database? Is there a database on a server? So I want to wrap a function around here first. Function, we'll call it initDB, initialize database. It has a starting curly brace, which we will wrap around the the instantiation. So generic object, <coughs> then instantiation, and then the last item in the function, return db. Whatever we did in this function, I want to return it back to the whole app. I don't want it to, <coughs> to only exist in this function. I want to return it. Let's see here. Create an object to store a database. Function to initialize database. This line uh, instantiates a new pouch DB to our object, our variable. And the last line returns the object back to the, to the main app, to the namespace, to the main, uh, to the main world of the app. If we didn't do that, we really would only be able to work with the with the database in the function. We're returning it to the main app.
so to speak. Now that it's inside of a function, then we need to call the function in order for us to create the database. So after setting up the function, then we call the function init db. And we'll have it also console log. So actually then there, uh, create the db for the first time. Save it and run it, and it should behave exactly the same as before, but the point of this is to create an initialization function that we can call anytime we want. Later on, we're going to make a... we're going to write code to delete the database, to start all over. And obviously, in my mind, that makes sense. I delete the database, I'm ready to go. But obviously, with experience in programming, we need to program all of that sequence. In a regular app, when I click Reset, something happens we now have to deal with that something. So initialize, creating an initialization function is part of that sequence. Let me check my result, and it should behave the same as before. Refreshing, same as before. Okay, so next, the user is going to type various things into those boxes. We want to retrieve those things. We're going to store them in variables. We're going to create various variables uh, to store what the users have typed. We're also going to store, we're also going to create variables that are references to various HTML nodes. It's a fancy way of saying we're going to write some JavaScript so that we are able to use those buttons. In a sense, sort of attaching or opening up the ability to use these buttons in JavaScript. A common way then is to create JavaScript objects that are references to the HTML tags. I'm going to create some variables. We've got jQuery Mobile. Sorry, we've got jQuery. The point of jQuery is write less, do more. So we're going to create various variables based in jQuery to interact with the HTML elements. It's common practice to start off variables in if we're using jQuery with a dollar symbol. So dollar symbol, I'll call this EL for element, BTN, save. I'm creating a, a JavaScript variable. It's based in jQuery. That's why I'm using the dollar symbol. I'm creating a variable that is a reference to an element that is a button called save up on the HTML equal to dollar symbol parentheses quotes what's the ID of my button to save. btn save. Up here, my button to save, or go, I'm sorry, I call it btn go, not btn save, btn go. So this is equivalent to document dot get element by id btn go. But because it's jQuery, this is the dollar symbol. That's it. All of this here is document.getElementById btn go, my save button. I'm storing a reference to that object in this variable. So now I can do things to it or do things with it a lot easier. I now have to simply reference this variable or object instead of typing document.getElementById over and over. 
I want to do that for all my buttons and all my input boxes. So comma, next line, dollar el element btn cancel equals jQuery selector pound btn cancel comma jQuery symbol element btn show I'm making these up I could call these anything I want of course equals jQuery selector pound btn show so it's a little tedious but once it's set up it will uh, it will pay off because write less, do more. Once I set it up for the first time, um, we don't want all the input buttons just yet. Actually, uh, we want the form in general. So el form class, an element that defines that form in the HTML, and that's equal to dollar quotes pound form class id equals form class. For the moment, lastly, we will do el, el div show. That is our div show. And that's an, an, that's an end of line. Notice I'm putting commas on all of these. I'm borrowing this var. Create a variable. Comma. Another variable. Comma, another and another. I'm done creating variables. End of line. That was technically one line. It broke it into multiple lines, of course, to be readable. Missing. Missing a comma. Sorry. There we go. So we need a comma at the end of each one, except for the final one terminates. Again, depending how obsessive you are about things, this might look nice if I tab these over. Nice. And then I'll write a comment here. Created various jQuery-based objects. dollar is commonly used to denote a jq object or variable. We have a way to do this with plain old JavaScript. And we usually don't use the dollar. And so these objects, these variables that we created with jQuery, now we basically can only use jQuery flavor JavaScript on them. If I wanted to use a plain old JavaScript command on a jQuery object, it wouldn't work. So I can make a note of that. In creating a jq variable, we should only use jq commands or methods on them. Vice versa doesn't work. Yes. Yes, we are basically sort of storing the HTML tag in this variable in jQuery to access it or affect it too. And it doesn't make too much sense at the moment, but give me one note what I'm saying here at the end. If we created a variable using jQuery, we really should then only use jQuery methods or commands on that object. It doesn't work to use plain JavaScript on it. And I'll, I'll point that out at various times. Yes. 
That's true, yes. I'm confusing myself. Yes, we call that div results. Sorry about that. So we are referencing div results, and then that's div results. We would have gotten an error if we let it in for me to go and then see the error and then we would figure out our error, but that's exactly right. We have a div results in the HTML section, which we then create a variable for. Let's just save and run this. We shouldn't get any errors. Nothing works yet, but it's good to check the code once in a while. If I, I'm going to just keep a div show for a moment just to see that error. If it was the wrong thing, uh, hmm. it might not have actually shown an error. Sometimes that, that happens that, that they're a little harder to troubleshoot. Okay, so once we've got these objects, we could do things such as event handlers. Now we can wait for someone clicking the button to do something. After this, let's then say uh, dollar element button save dot on method. This is the use the jQuery method of on to wait for a click on the button. So something on an event, some object, we're waiting for something to happen on an event, something to trigger something. So now that we have a reference to the button of go, we can wait for someone to click. So on click, <coughs> on the event of a click or a tap, it's synonymous. When someone clicks the button, something will happen. And the something will be comma, some function, fn, save class. This is the syntax. We don't put parentheses here. Uh, we touched on this last, one of the last times where the basic syntax was, was that if we needed the parentheses to pass in an, a, a parameter, then we do the function, anonymous function call. We're keeping it simple here. So on the event of a click upon that save button, run a function. Let's define the function. function save, class, parentheses, curly brace, and that's our syntax. I'll also write here, uh, and function save class. This uh, function is going to be a little, a little long, so it'd be good to mark where it ends because we're going to lose track of that. process, uh, the user input to save data to pouch. That's the purpose of this function. If we're going to type something, they'll click go. Go will, go will then trigger save classes, save class. And a bunch of stuff will happen here. Gather the data, bundle it, process it, whatever, save it to the database. In the function is the moment where we're going to check what did the person type. We didn't create elements up here to store what the person typed. We didn't need it at that moment. We need to check what did they type at the moment they click save. So inside of this function we'll create some variables in the same sort of idea as before. Uh, dollar 
This time we'll call it uh, val value CRN equal to jQuery selector to select pound in CRN at the end dot val. So there's the object in the HTML ID equals in CRN. Let's check its value. What did the person type? Let's check the value of that and store it in this object. Comma, we need to do that also for val of a class. That's dollar quotes pound in class dot val and val inst. Yes? Dot val is a jQuery method, a command, that all that it does is checks what's the value of that input field. Or we can also use it to store a value there. Retrieve or store a value. So we're just checking what did the person type in that input box. Okay. So, so in, in process, uh, the input field is The purpose of the dot val is to is to is to check what is typed. In inst dot val. End of statement. So a person clicks go, it starts the save class function. Then we check what did they type in CRM, what did they type in class and inst check what that is. The way to check that is with val. Then we save those in local scope variables, variables that only exist while this function is running. We're storing them temporarily to do something with them. I'll say here, um, obviously we can't do multiple line comments here because it's going to comment out everything, so that's why I'm doing single line comments. <coughs> But uh, here we'll say uh, using jQuery val method to check what the person, what was typed into the input fields, into the inputs, then storing as jq variables, objects. So that's what that block is doing right there. We'll do some console output, then we'll take a break. So we'll say console.log uh, dollar uh, val CRN. I think we can do commas here. Class and val inst. Let me just confirm that. Okay, so we'll do some quick uh, console output right here. We can output more than one thing at once. Commas, not we can do pluses, but it's concatenation. This is a little different. So uh, we're going to go to the console and display what did they type in the in the CRN comma. What did they type in the class? What did they type in the piece? Save it and run it. Type real data or gibberish and click go, and then see your console and you should see your data. It's not being saved to the database yet, but we're setting ourselves up to retrieve that data. Once we're able to do that, then we're able to process it. So save and run that. If it worked, take a break. If it didn't, call me over. It's 7.25. We'll take a break until 7.35. And how it should work at this point is if you type in something. I'll type 123 Android part 1 instructor Smith. Click go. Your console should say that data that you typed. Your CRN, your class, 
your inst. If you get errors, call me over, but this is what it is so far.